pleasure to see all of you. I mean, almost see all of you. I mean, we're kind of, I think we were over with COVID as of April, and COVID is definitely not over us. Um, so thank you for being uh, here and uh, complying with the regulations that, that the uh, library has imposed. Uh, the performers will be without masks that were if they're far enough away, and they also, you also want to be able to understand them and everything that they're saying. And today's program is uh, it's a series of four programs that we've designed to kick off our, our series after an 18, 19 month hiatus. And this is all about the versatile piano and the versatile pianists. Um, it's an incredible instrument. Um, I see several keyboard players and the audience are nodding their head. It really is a joy to be able to play this instrument. And it, it is uh, probably the most versatile instrument because it's used in almost every medium in every genre of music. And the, the performers are just as unique as the repertoire. And today, we're featuring uh, two artists who come to us from the opera world. And um, uh, from the New York City Opera, Susan Versace has moved here. When did you move here, Susan? Just last year? A year ago, August. A year ago, August. Um, she moved to Sarasota, and uh, she currently is uh, the pianist for the Choral Arts of Sarasota. We're glad to have her on board for that group. And uh, she has some great stories to share with you uh, from the New York City Opera. And Jesse Martins is here with the Sarasota Opera. And Jesse, you are, are you're still involved with the youth opera, correct? Yes, I'm the youth opera music director. He's the youth opera music director, and he will be, um, he conducted Magic Flutes um, roughly two years ago, two and a half years ago or so. With the Sarasota Opera, and we'll be doing the uh, which one is the one that is Daughter of the Regiment. The Daughter of the Regiment this coming winter season. We'll be conducting that, so we're looking forward to hearing some of his stories. Um, uh, none of the stories leave this room. <laughs> or the internet. Or the internet. <laughs> no, actually, it's being recorded for that. So I know. Do, so. <laughs> but uh, I, I wanted to start off the program today just by asking them a few questions to get a, the ball rolling. Um, you are here at you know, a participatory, so you know, feel free at, at any point if you'd like to ask a question if something is being said that you don't quite understand or you'd like to get further information about it. Um, absolutely, and because this is designed to be you know, a, a talking performance, so to speak, and you're just as important as, as the performers themselves. Welcome. Um, so, um, I just want to bring you up uh, first. This is Susan. Hello, everybody. And uh, <laughs> so uh, I, I think it's always fascinating to find out how musicians get their start, um, because you know, especially in the piano world, because you know, you, you think of you know, John Thompson little teaching little fingers how to play. Did you start out with that? Yes, I did. I still have that book. I do too. Yeah. I love from a wig Wong. Yeah. That was my favorite. <laughs> <first. laughs> I miss that. I can still play it. Yeah. <laughs> We have a lot in common, but our, our careers take different paths. So, I mean, you, you started with piano lessons, but I think you should tell us sort of how you got into the opera world. Okay. Now, one thing I can say about accompanists is that we normally don't talk. So, this is unusual for me. Um, I started out, I taught public school, 6th, 7th, 8th grade in Lakewood, Ohio. And I enjoyed it, but it you know it never really improved every year. The, the poor principal kept trying to get us to get choir in the day, and he never could. So the last year he said, I'm sorry, I can't do it. That was the year I decided to that would be my last and go to graduate school. And a friend of mine said, Oh, there's a good graduate school at the University of Illinois with John Wistwin. I never heard of it, but I thought, oh, okay. so I practiced and practiced and prepared myself. And on March 13th, I went out there to do my audition for him. His, uh, his assistant, Dan Ragomi, came to pick me up at the airport, Willard Airport, and said, you're very lucky Mr. Wistman is here this weekend. And I said, why? And uh, he said, well, because he just got back last night for having done The Tonight Show. And I was with Pavarotti. And I was so impressed with The Tonight Show and Johnny Carson, but I'd never heard of Pop Rossi. <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I started. <laughs> My first lesson was a few weeks later, and um, I didn't have any singers, so I took 
my brand new books that the same assistant told me to get. And I opened up the first page of the Soprano album and played that. And Mr. Wishman said, first one in the book? And I said, yeah. And it was Aida. <laughs> and he said, well, here at the University of Illinois, we're not likely to do Aida, but I'll sing it for you. So he sang, Ritor Na Vinci Tor, and I played. And then he said to me, well, you know, these singers, they like to stay on high notes because it feels good and they can show off. So I'm going to try to do that and see if you can follow me. So he did. And I laughed and I laughed because I thought it was the worst sound I'd ever heard. And I laughed so hard, he couldn't sing anymore and he started laughing. And that's how I started as an accompanist. <laughs> <laughs> that's quite an auspicious start. <laughs> <laughs> and he's 90 years old, still going strong. So, Jesse, you want to come up for a second? So, uh, Jesse hails from uh, Brazil. Yep. Uh, where are you from in Brazil? I'm from the south of Brazil. Porto Alegre is the capital of the, the state I'm from, but it's at the very bottom of the country. Oh, so it's almost next to um, Argentina. Argentina. Oh, nice one. Beautiful. Beautiful part of the world. <laughs> so how did you get your start in the, the music world, in the opera world? Uh -huh. So I joined a choir when I was uh, 10 years old, and the conductor the following year said everybody needed to choose an instrument. So I chose the piano and fell in love with it completely, and it became my, my instrument. So for a long time, I was just accompanying uh, violin players, you know, string players, wind players. Um, as I got close to university age, I was accompanying the tests you know, to get into university for my friends. And then once I got into college, I found out on my second year that the singers need to use the accompanist way more often than the violin player that wanted to have one rehearsal and the, the test, you know, the end of semester uh, jury. And the singers needed to rehearse once a week and bring me to their lessons, which meant I could make so much more money <laughs> playing for singers than I could for violin players. So I, at first, just, you know, saw it as a financial opportunity, and then I heard my first opera, which was Trovatore, by Verdi, and I, I was baffled. I didn't know opera existed. The singers so far had been singing art songs, and you know that exp I didn't have that exposure. Brazil doesn't have a lot of opera companies, so when I heard that opera, I just I I was baffled. I didn't know that kind of sound and, and grandeur existed, and the stories of the opera. So it was halfway through college that I started basically inviting myself to other voice teachers and, and to play lessons and to get more and more involved with opera. Um, as Susan was saying, you know, a lot of um, pianists that work with opera, you know, not everybody wants or, or likes the conducting side of opera. You know, some people are more comfortable as a coach. And for me, it was a natural transition like from being coach and being working with opera all the time to realizing that as a conductor, I get to make some decisions that as a coach, I don't. So I, you know, for me, it was a little more natural to, to become a conductor in that way, but that's how I got started. So I, I would just like to point out something. It, it has been obvious that Susan got involved because she could go on television with Johnny Carson. <laughs> you got involved because the money was better. Yeah. Okay, it had nothing to do with the art, right? Yeah. No. <laughs> That's easy. <laughs> there are all sorts of reasons for But um, you mentioned something, I, I'm gonna ask this question now, because, uh, and again, if you all have questions for Alco, please, you know, we're gonna start with music in just a second. Um, uh, you have a preference over the terminology because yes. the word accompanist is sort of been retired to a certain extent. And pianist is just, you know, just a general terminology for, for what, you, what we do, right? I mean, it covers all pianists. I mean, and then in the opera world, there's another one. That, what's it called? The assistant conductor. The assistant conductor. There's also the repetitive, right? Right. Not in this country. Though. Not in this country, but they do in Europe. They have Which a, is interchangeable in a way, right? The repetitor is almost our assistant conductor. 
It's very it is. Similar. It is the same. Yeah. Right. Teaches you the music. I'm sorry. Repetitura teaches you the music yeah. and plays the rehearsals. And so does the assistant conductor. Yeah. Right. So, so I'm just curious. Do you have a preference as to which term you like to use? I like assistant conductor. It's sort of exalted. <laughs> but we play in the trenches. Yes, I, I agree. I think you know when you are working in a production, you are the assistant conductor because there are a lot of things we do to assist the conductor of the production to make it successful. Uh, but I think also in the opera world, outside of a production, a lot of people refer to accompanists as coaches. I saw vocal coach because we help singers learn their music as well. Yeah, which means that you also need to learn the languages. Mm -hmm. That's, right? That's something to keep in mind. Okay. Yeah. So now I'm going to turn it over to Susan, who's going to take us into the musical aspects of the program. Okay. And, um, Thank you. My pleasure. Susan Versace. Okay. Um, I tell you, the microphone is sort of daunting to me, but we'll do our best. Oh, I'm going to put it down. I hand out to you uh, three pieces of music. And I want to look at the first piece that's right at the very top of it. And I think it should it should have written on it Handel's Partenope. You see that? Okay. One of the things that we do is uh, I'll, I'll do the glamorous parts first. One of the things that we do is play in the orchestra part, orchestra part, orchestra pit. <clears throat> and Handel presents. Um, something different than other pieces, in that if you're looking, if you look where I said to start, which is at scene two, and look at the piano part, you'll see that there's only one note there. And then the next measure, the next to the right of that, has another note, and underneath it is a, it looks like a crisscross, like a tic-tac-toe, a sharp sign. And that gives us a little bit of an uh, uh, a hint that it's a major chord. Other than that, you have to figure out what chords to play and where. So, when you do Baroque music, uh, there's lots of things to do. You have to translate, you have to be able to speak the words and, and try to make sense out of the phrase, because if you can't sing it, you can't play it. And also helps when the singers do it, then you get ideas from them, of course. Um, you have to work with uh, other instruments who play at the same time as you. There's always a cellist who sits. If this was the orchestra, the conductor was there, orchestra is here, stage is there, audience is here. So the harpsichord is right here, and then right here is a cello and a string bass. We're all part of your little combo. And then right there is the theorbo player. Do you know what a theorbo is? Theorbo is, it looks like a, like a guitar, and then it has a long neck that's about five feet. So when the, the theorbo player sits there, many times that neck will come over and basically almost hit you in the face. <laughs> so, you know, you, you need insurance for this kind of a job. <laughs> So, so you organize the harpsichord or the theorbo usually leads this combo throughout the entire piece. The conductor does not do it. We play the recitatives, and the recitatives are the part of the handle music that where the action actually happens. Conversations happen and we develop the plot. And then the next thing is arias or duets, and that's where they all sing about what they thought about the plot. So we play all of that and make up our parts the entire way. Um, if it's not conducted, our part. So what I'd like to do is do a little bit of partenope for you, which is a Handel opera, and it was uh, premiered in 1730. The characters are partenope, who is the queen of Naples, and she's in love with Arsace. Arsace is a prince of, prince of Corinth who is in love with her as well as Rosemira from the old country. Armindo is a prince of Rhodes. He's also in love with Partenope. And then um, Rosemira is a princess of Cyprus and she has just arrived 
looking for our Sachi, and she's arrived in disguise as a man. So we have two countertenors that sound like girls, and then we have a mezzo who's dressed like a boy. That's Handel. <laughs> and it's usually crazy. You know, we think of Handel as being the Messiah and serious. It's not. A lot of it is just one send up after another. And this piece is no exception. So uh, if you look at the words, I'm going to read them and translate it for you first. Armindo is the one that speaks first, and you can tell his name is written in bold type. He says, Arsace, just to greet his uh, friend. Arsace says, Armindo. And then Armindo says to uh, oh, anybody, Oserva, look. Arsace, in parentheses, means that he's thinking this, but you don't. He, our God, uh, our middle doesn't hear it. E qual volto e presente agli occhi miei. And what face has just presented itself in front of my eyes? Parthenope then comes in, who's the queen, and says, Hola, hi everybody. And then to uh, the new person, Que vuoi, what do you want? Rosmira, who's, then she answers in parentheses first, only to herself, Fingere de Gio. I've got to pretend. Voi ma sistete o dei. God help me. Then she speaks to the um, princess, the queen rather. Generosa regina delle campagne armene, il principe e rumene e urimene a te singina. Generous queen from the country of Armenia. The Prince Ayurimene, remember she's got boy clothes on, bows to you. So then she bows. So we know we have to do something with a bow. Sorgi, Partenope responds, Sorgi, rise, e di la tua brama, and say what you'd like. Rosmira, now again in parentheses because this is only her thought, are such a queen, non minca no la fama. Our Sache is here, and the word of his being here didn't, is not, it wasn't, a dis, wasn't a deceit, it was true. Then she goes on to the queen. Con cento veli e cento londe io scorrea. With a hundred ships and through a hundred waves I plowed. Quando rida tempesta fuorche la mia, tutti assorbì le navi. When a horrible storm, um, Thank all the ships except for mine. She continues, Mi spinze a questo lido. It threw me onto this beach. E qui mi trae di tui virtu virtuti al grido. And it led me right here uh, at the sound of your renowned voice. Partenope responds, Ora dimmi, now tell me, what do you want? And that's, that's his recitative. Now I'd like to show you what we have to do in order to play it. Now, am I supposed to turn this off? It's right here, folks. Is it on? 
You hear me? Now. Yeah, I think so. Uh, so 50 years later, Mozart wrote Le Nozze di Figaro, The Marriage of Figaro. And he, of course, knew of Handel's music and Handel's style. But 50 years is a long time in the music world, and things change. They, they just develop. And in this case, the accompaniment developed in the recitatives, the part where we have the conversations and um, what the job of the harpsichord is. In this case, I played a forte piano, which was really kind of fun because it has a pedal and you, you operate it with your knee. No more theorical vibe. No more string bass, just the cello. And Mozart made it uh, so that we could even throw in some cutesy kind of things that, that define the characters a little bit, whatever we wanted to play. So that was fun. Um, the chords are indicated, as you can see. We'll start on it's page 35, and you'll count down the music lines. One, two, three, four. And you'll see Susanna. Uh, so, he wrote in chords. So now we know what the harmonies are. We didn't have to think about that so much. And then our job is just to interpret how we want to play those chords. Um, I'll just give you a little bit of this one. Susanna begins by saying, well, the story is, the count, they're, they're getting married. The whole marriage of Figaro is one day, and it's the day that Figaro and Susanna get married. The count has given them a big room for their bedroom. And uh, Figaro is real excited about this because he thinks it's a great room and he's measuring for the bed. Uh, Susanna is not so excited about it and she's going to tell him why. The count's room is here, there's a door there, and the countess's room is there. So there, it's easy access. Susanna doesn't like that. She, it's so, and I'll tell you why. She says, it's because è la destina per ottenere da me certe mezz'ore. He has intended to obtain from me certain half hours. Che uh, il diritto feudale, which the, the feudal right, dot, 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 I grow up. And the feudal right, do you know what that is? Yeah, the, some of you who are not quite sure. The feudal right is the right of the master to have a maid in his service before she gets married. So, yeah, no wonder they hated those Very people. tactful. Huh? Very tactful. Thank you. <laughs> well, you know, I've done it before. So, anyway, Figaro says, Come, what? Nei feudi suoi non l'hai il conte abolito, abolito? Didn't the count already abolish this feudal right? Susanna says, e ben ora e pentito. Well, now he's sorry. E per che tenti riscattarlo da me. And he would really like to start out with me. <coughs> Figaro says, bravo, good. Mi piace. I really like that. And they're very sarcastic, of course. Che caro signor Conte. What a dear, good old Mr. Count. Ci vogliamo divertir. We will have some kind of fun. Trovate, and trovato avete. You've already found, then we hear a little ding ling ling Chi suona? Who made that sound? La Contessa coming from this side. Susanna knows that she has to go, so she says, Addio, fi, fi, Figaro bello. Bye-bye, you handsome Figaro. And Figaro says, Coraggio mio tesoro. Be brave, my darling. And Susanna finishes with, and you, use your head. So that's how this scene works out. Now I'll show you that one. <clears throat> E la destina per ottenere da me certe mesure, che io diritto figlio dai, come nei peiori suoi, non l'hai al conte abolito, e per ora pentito, e perché intento riscattarlo da me, bravo, mi piace, che caro si ricordi, ci voglio divertire, trovato avete, chi suona? Oh, 
go. And that's how that works. <laughs> okay. Now, we'll get to the serious music with Jesse, and I'll come back and I'll explain to you some of the other things that coaches do in the Opera House. Uh, that you would be surprised at, actually. <laughs> and then I have one more piece I want to play for you. So, I'll let Jesse have the piano. Thank you. Figaro is such a wonderful opera, and it's, um, I don't know if you know the story, but it was written by Beaumarchais, the play. And when he wrote it, it was banned at first for years to come. And people got word of it, that it was a wonderful play, and they started selling copies of it in the black market. So when the play finally premiered, people were so crazy to watch it that they broke into the theater because they couldn't wait any longer. And Beaumarchais had to be in a box that was caged so people wouldn't <laughs> get to him. Um, and that's one of the things I find quite fascinating about opera is that for instance, in Figaro, you have the two servants of nobility who are the focus <laughs> of the story. And they are the ones actually in charge, although it might not seem like it, but the whole plot of the opera basically revolves around Susanna being very smart and knowing how to play the Count and his temper, and they work it out in a way that the Count is caught for cheating on the countess and has to ask for forgiveness at the end. Um, and it's, it, 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 these operas always get to me in the sense that, you know, I try to put myself back in 1786 when the opera was premiered and the people who were watching it, you know, seeing people of their class on stage and being in charge of the story. Um, but the scene I chose to play for you today is from the opera Tosca by Puccini. Has anybody seen this opera before? Oh my God, look at you. I hope you're coming to watch it again when we do it in the winter. <laughs> um, I think uh, Puccini has, alongside Verdi, one of the, the, those operas, lots of operas that are very big, right? In terms of size, of chorus, of characters, of the, the needs of the stage. And when I was thinking about you know, to talk about what an assistant conductor does. Uh, I kept going back to these big operas because, as Susan was saying, she was showing a little bit about the, the coaching of the singer and the language and how we start that process. And then in the process of a production, we uh, are, in a way, in the center of it all. Because as the assistant conductor, you were there to facilitate the conductor's vision to play all rehearsals, to coach all singers, and to also help, for instance, in Tosca, you have uh, many things that have to be done backstage to, that it's not done in the pit, right? So it's not the orchestra who's doing it. It's an assistant conductor who is somewhere backstage ready to do the cannon shot to let them know, you know, the prisoner has escaped or the church bells who, who are representing different churches in Rome, um, or cueing a chorus that might be singing off stage, and all of that has to line up with what's going on stage, right? Um, so Tosca, for me, it's one of those operas that, that shows a lot of, of what we do, and, and we have to do a lot in a production like Tosca. Um, so, the scene I chose to play for you today is from Act 2, and I'm sure if, you, if you've been to Tosca before, you probably, like me, likes Act 2 a lot. <laughs> um, Tosca is about, um, it's, the, the story is in Rome, happens in Rome, um, around the times of the Napoleonic Wars, and Rome uh, and Italy the different kingdoms of Italy were at times at fight with each other, at times fighting Napoleon, and in this case you have a chief of police, Scarpia, who is, um, who has one side of the, the fight, right, and he is searching for a, a political prisoner who escaped, Angelotti, um, and the tenor of the opera, Cavaradossi, is a painter, and he helps hide Angelotti. 
And Cavaradossi's girlfriend, Tosca, is um, a singer, an opera singer, uh, and Scarpia is in love with her. So as you, in, in a good opera, you always have a, a love triangle, right? Um, and in this case, it's the torture scene. So in Act 2, uh, Scarpia has gotten a hold of Cavaradossi. And he's trying to get him to tell him where his hidden Angelotti. And of course, he will not say. So then he brings Tosca in and starts trying to convince her to tell him where Cavaradossi has a hidden Angelotti. And at first, she obviously pretends she knows nothing, she doesn't want to say, but as the scene goes on, they keep torturing Cavaradossi. Now, I find that Puccini and, and the, the librettists created such a great moment because Cavaradossi is off stage being tortured. So we keep hearing his screams and his plights to Tosca not to tell Scarpia anything. But as the scene goes on and the torture continues, Tosca does tell him where Angelotti is. When Cavaradossi finds out that she gave Angelotti up, he gets very mad at her, but news of uh, Napoleon winning the battle comes in, which means Scarpia's side lost. And Cavaradossi gets so excited about this victory that he one last time defies Scarpia and shows how, you know, his power that in a way Scarpia thought he was taken away. So Cavaradossi at the end of the scene is screaming victory, victory, and that is what seals his fate as Scarpia sends him out to be executed um, in Act 3. Now, the rest of the act continues as Tosca tries to make a deal with Scarpia and tells him that if he gives them a letter basically letting them get out of Rome together, that she will give herself to him. And when he signs the letter and is about to take her, she kills him. She stabs him with the letter opener and rushes to try and save um, Cavaradossi. So I will play part of the scene, not, not the whole scene, um, but I think you'll be able to tell by the way Puccini writes the music, this sequence of events, because I mean, it's a lot of singing that you probably don't want me to do. Uh, so <laughs> I won't be singing a lot, but Puccini's music is great in the sense it's called Verismo style. And Verismo is something that came at the end of what we consider romantic music. And it, it was more connected to reality in the sense of the storytelling. So in this case, you know, the story is much more close to, to the time that they're talking about. So let's do a little Tosca. Okay.
has told her, please don't tell anything. And now Skypa starts dressing her. It's time for you to tell. And then the 
last defiance of Skarka before his sent end. <laughs> You can tell it's a very uh, dramatic, right? But also the scene that 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 this opera, that the scene is, is very dramatic as well. Uh, but I, I hope you could tell by the change in how the music is written, that the different uh, moments of the scene. Um, so that was good. <laughs> You put your soul into it, you put every bit of energy you have into it, and then you do that and they say, okay, that's five minutes, yeah. <laughs> and it's all done, and then you do it again and again. So by the time you've done it, your fingers are bleeding and you... <laughs> yeah, and I think that was one of the reasons I wanted to become a conductor, was that because at some point, I was done. When the orchestra arrives, they're not done. I mean, you still have things to do, right? You take notes, you coach singers, you do backstage conducting, but it's different. Yes. You're not creating that music anymore because now you have an orchestra, right? So I think that was, for me, was part of it. It was like, I didn't want to let, it, to let the music go, so I, I wanted to, to conduct so I could see it through. <laughs> it's fun to play. Yeah. Do you have any questions that you'd like to ask of us before I wrap it up? Yeah. What you just did, is that right for rehearsal only? And then you go away when the orchestra comes out and plays all what you did? Yeah. Okay. So, so a piano vocal score is a, an arrangement of the orchestral score that was usually done by a pianist. Um, and it's, you know, they try to put in the piano arrangement the things that you would hear the most. And that give the music the, the color and the and the emotion of it. Um, and then once the orchestra arrives, if you're an assistant conductor, like Susan was showing you recitative from Mozart and, and Handel, that means that one of the assistant conductors would be in the pit playing the harpsichord or the fortepiano throughout the production. And maybe you are also helping the conductor by taking notes, you know, to communicate to the orchestra or to the musicians. But then usually your job as a pianist playing the score is done, pretty much. That's true. <laughs> it's kind of hard on our ego because you, I mean, I can tell from you, Jesse, you're one of those two. You give it your all, then the orchestra comes in and gets, you know, they do better once says, oh, I'm so glad it's with the orchestra. <laughs> and you've just tried so hard to play well. And, but it's you know it's it's part of the part of the job. It says the orchestra, the orchestra comes in and and plays. And a piece like Tosca, there's nothing for us to play in it. It's all 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 the band. We do play the offstage chimes. And sometimes it's real chimes, and sometimes it's like a keyboard. And you would be the one that would cue cover and say one two scream. And uh, you know what? How about your part is, is done and you're, you're leave, you leave it on the rehearsal room floor? Yeah. Can you say a bit about what kind of plan you 
planning you have with the conductor in advance of starting the rehearsals? Is he sharing an overall vision with you, or no, no, never, never, no, he's not at all with this? No, sometimes you have to beg them for that, but they, no, you just, you come, and then some people you've known for a long time, so you just sort of know how it's going to go. But I remember when Harry Bickett came, who's now a big famous Baroque conductor, all over the place, I saw him in the green room, and the, it, I used to work at City Opera, and we had, the green room was where the coffee machines were, et cetera. It wasn't really green, and... Uh, I, he was sitting there drinking hot chocolate, and I said, are you Harry Bigot? He said, yes. I said, are you Susan? I said, yes. And then we started the rehearsal. <laughs> <laughs> Can you, uh, for Manhattanites, or people who are fascinated with opera and Manhattan, uh, all of the arts there, what are some of the venues where you went to practice? Is it usually in the actual pit or set construction? But what's going? Well, well you, do you want to talk about how? What is the build-up in an opera? In other words, is it just well, describe some of the steps where you were in. Uh, at City Opera, where I worked, we were. If you if you if you can imagine what Lincoln Center looks like. Yes. The Met's in the middle, and on the right is the orchestra, and we were on the left. And it was called State Theater until it was rebuilt. Um, and we rehearsed, there were rehearsal rooms in the basement that were smaller than this, and we rehearsed. And we also had the, the fifth floor, which was a big hall, but we shared it with the ballet. And so when they were there, they get it first. So we, we went back and forth between those places. My first coaching I ever, ever had to do was in this little closet room in the basement. We called it room B. And it was a little teeny tiny upright piano. And I had to do the special ending that they had decided to do with Turandot, with the cover Turandot and the cover Kalaf. And if, and if you know what, it, what it's like to be a cover, you really have got to try to impress somebody. So in this little teeny tiny room, they were trying to impress each other, and me too, although it didn't make any difference about me. And so they were singing as loud as they could possibly sing. And I was thinking, I'll never live through this experience. <laughs> so, yeah, it's lots of different places. But it was all, for, for us, it was in Lincoln Center, right then, safe theater. And you? Well, here at Sarasota Opera, we, we own the theater and in the rehearsal space, so it's all rehearsed right here across the street. Now, uh, it, the way a, an opera production is put together, obviously the orchestra is the last one to join, right? Um, and the, the staging, which is the rehearsal of the, the, the movement on stage, is it's the second step. So the first step is the music rehearsal. So you meet the conductor if you are a guest assistant, right? In my case, I know most of the conductors here because I've been with Sarasota Opera for 10 years now. But in the case of a, of a guest, it's when you do the music rehearsals, when the conductor shows you for the first time, basically, what his vision is and what he wants to entrust you to rehearse with the singers when he's not there. So there's a musical rehearsal portion of it that then is followed by staging, which is a little more time consuming because everything needs to be planned for safety and for everything else that is involved. But those rehearsals are done not on stage, but in a room similar to this one, where stage management will tape on the floor the main units on stage. So if you have a staircase, if you have a window, if the window opens or not, all of that is color-coded with tape on the floor. So then the entire company is rehearsing the opera and staging it in the room. And then when you get closer to opening is when you then do what leads up to tag week, which is the rehearsals on stage, which is then when you find out maybe some issues that you stage it in a way that you know, he can be seen by people sitting on the house left, so then you have to adjust the singers in order to, to make it as, as good as you can. Um, and 
That gets all the way to what we call piano dress, which is when we run the whole opera without the orchestra. So the pianist, the assistant conductor, it's kind of our last hurrah, usually. It's like a concerto. Yeah, you, you play the piano dress rehearsal, which is the opera beginning to end, um, with the singers, with the costumes, the first time the singers have the costumes on stage. And that rehearsal is meant to catch anything else that just went by, right? So if there's a big issue with an offstage chime or the organ about the volume level or lining it up with the singers, all of that needs to be sorted in this piano dress rehearsal. Because a then- lot of technician there with the, with, the, with the sound technicians, the lighting guys. Yes. So every designer is trying to fix any problems that they might have with the light cue, with the wig, with the makeup. Is it too light? Is it too dark under the light? Or you know, if you need to take off a piece of cloth, you know that that it works and it needs to work in the second you need it to work, right? Um, so all of that needs to be fixed before you bring in the orchestra, because now you're adding you know 60 staff members to I'm each hall which costs a lot of money, right? So by the time you bring the orchestra in, the production should be running smoothly, right? So you still have that opportunity to then make it work with the orchestra, but you are basically the week of opening already. So that's kind of like the overall process, and each of the staffs has very big staff that is responsible for different aspects. Now, both of your, your um, company, repertory company, Yes. So that you did not have the individual who flies in for his two no. as uh, no. you know, and then, and then, and then yeah. here. No. But um, have you ever, uh, when, when you have one of those guests uh -huh. wandering through for two performances, let's say, or three performances, uh -huh. at what point do they, where do they insert? The morning of? Yeah. I mean, I think it really depends on the company. And you know, the guests, the, the famous guest conductors that just drop in and, and do performances like that, they are not in the rehearsal process at all. So they, they, they literally come in to do it. Yeah, we don't have that here either. Um, but it, it's, you know, in bigger uh, opera companies, that happens a lot with singers too. You know, the, the Anna Cherko, which, you know, might not be available to do all the rehearsal process, so she will come in at the end and plug herself into the production. Yes. How many times do the singers actually rehearse before the performance with the full orchestra? It depends on the company, the budget, and the schedule. Um, and if it's an old production. Yeah, and it also depends on the size of the production, if it's a remount or if it's a new production. Uh, but each opera company has their own reality and, and their schedule. Here it's about three times, but one of them is not staged. So in, in German they would call it Sitzprobe, which is when you rehearse sitting down. Obviously they don't sit down to, to sing, but it means that it's usually not on stage, it's in a room, and it's the time to put singers and orchestra together without the pressure of the stage business. So it, that's the first encounter with singers and orchestra, it's in that fashion. And then some companies have what's called bundle pro, which is when they are on stage with the orchestra, but there is no costumes, and it's literally you, you wonder about the stage approximately where you're going to be, and you sing the whole opera like that. Um, and then you have, which is called the dress rehearsal, or the final dress rehearsal, which is when you put it all together with costumes, with lighting, with everything, just without an audience. But it depends. See, every company has their own way of doing it. I, I don't see how, how did you do it? Not like that. <laughs> you know, we went out of business. <laughs> and that was because of money. And, and these things are really expensive. And so we didn't have all those luxuries. We just had to try to try hard. And so uh, singers would get usually the, the uh, orchestra rehearsal if there was one. Now, if it was full whim, which has been done many times all over, you probably didn't get an extra rehearsal. You'd be lucky if you got a stage rehearsal with the orchestra. That didn't happen very much. Modern productions or new pieces always got what he's saying, 
But other than that, no, there just wasn't the money for that. Isn't there actually a, an orchestra, I believe it's still going, the Orpheum? Is it? Orpheus. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Orpheus. Yeah, there are yeah. a lot of our players. They, right they don't have a conductor. No, they don't, and they really play well. They're terrific. But it's not an opera, it's just they just play yeah, it. Yeah, orchestra. Sure. So, yeah. All right, so I'm going to ask one last question because if you need to tie this up so we can finish up. Yeah, I want to play my first. Yes, yes, exactly. But, but um, I don't care, you mentioned playing, playing the entire opera all the way through. Yeah. As the scores are getting more and more complicated throughout the 19th and the 20th century, how much of the page are you actually playing? And how much are you recreating or reimagining? In performances? No, in the actual dress rehearsal, you know, when you do the camera. Well, in, in handle. You know what I'm saying, right? Because, because sometimes they throw in, you know, the pitching the same and everything in these scores, you've got to well, choose. Well, you, you yeah, uh, in handle, you play everything, every, every bar. As Mozart came in, you played just the recitatives and the rest of the pieces. You probably didn't play at all. And then as each composer developed as they composed, and lots of times they had no piano or, or keyboard in the pit at all. But that's, but that's not, not the question I'm asking. asking. Oh, ask it the again. question I'm asking is, you know, in that rehearsal, when you play oh. the entire opera, yeah. right, how much of the page are you actually playing? Oh, or how much but well, are okay. you Leaving out. Leaving out. Oh, or how much, how much are you Is that the word you're talking about? Uh, you, you modify. I have small hands, and so I have to modify chords a lot. So it's, but you know, sometimes these piano productions are written by the string bass players who have no clue what the piano is like. <laughs> so you just sort of like, now, yeah, it brings up something that I did want to talk about, and that is, and I know that you do it because you're a conductor. I have always taken the orchestra score and go on through it with a fine tooth comb and look for things that are there that are not in the piano score or that things in the piano score that don't exist at all. And that could be you know, a horn part, a clarinet part, forte, a, a, a markings of dynamics, markings of tempo, all kinds of things. And so I have always slugged through all of that before I ever play a note. Um, and you, you'd be surprised what you see is uh, in the piano score. It's not, it doesn't even exist. Yeah. I saw a hand over here. Did I not? Stretch. Oh, there. Oh, can yes. I say I admire, well, and I have good reason to admire what you do. I'll tell you later. <laughs> it's absolutely wonderful. And I wanted to ask Jesse. Um, Houdini doesn't double the vocal line in the orchestral score, right? Does. I mean, Sometimes it does, yeah. but, but not as much as, as some authors. Right. And so it's, it's a triple feat of genius that he can make the vocal line audible when he's playing well, a, a, a Strassel arrangement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because it's not always there in his class. Yeah. And he was making the vocal line, you could just hear it. Yeah, uh, that's right. Yeah. I have to admire the coaches, the work of them all my life, and they're geniuses. Because what they were just saying, they teach us to hear things that we're going to use as cues on stage. You have yeah. a clarinet that's going to bring you in for your entrance or whatever. Yeah. Well, you know, I am going to be surprised. <laughs> and I, I, it's always an insult to me when a singer says, I never heard that before. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you were going to talk about what really happens behind the scenes at the Opera House. Um, in terms of, of the, the needs backstage, each production is completely different, and we are support staff. So if there's a need of a sound effect, or like the thunder, Sound effects in opera are usually done by huge metal sheets that you, you literally shake them, right? So for that, for instance, I have a, a monitor that is a TV with the conductor, just his upper torso. I have a music stand, I have my score, and then I literally take my cues from the TV, from him, and adjust for the sound to travel and line up with the music that the artist is playing. Right? Or sometimes the singers start singing off stage and they need a conductor to be with them to make sure that helping them to stay lined up with um, the, the production. And that's one of the things we do backstage during an opera, for instance. 
you know, but aside from that, the coaching of the singers, giving notes to the musicians from the maestro, or sometimes operating the silver pipes. You know, somebody needs to read music and be able to change the English subtitles as the opera goes on. So that's just some of the of the extra uh, duties as a sign, I call them. We yeah. called them. We, yeah. we didn't have to do that. <laughs> And you're going to play one more song. I would right? like to play one more thing. Did you have a question first? Yes. yes. Um, is there a difference in the length of time, um, especially there for the opera, let's say, uh -huh. um, coaching the singers who are doing something that has been around for a long time? Yes. You know, the Lamb, I or whatever. Uh -huh. And the Battle of Lake Mono, which was, <laughs> you know, was the most obscure, obscure. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's what it is. So how long in advance did you have to start working to teach the battle of Legnano? Has to do with money. It has to do with money, but it also has to do with, I believe, if you're doing a, a very rare opera, you probably will find your singers earlier in the process than you would for a Tosca or a Bohème, because so many people know those roles and can sing them, right? But a role like uh, in Battaglia di Legnano, which is a very a, a rare a Verdi opera, not as much. So I think it differs more in that way that we would seek out singers earlier in the process, I believe. But the rehearsal process is the same, at least for us, because we are a festival company. So everybody comes to town at the same time to rehearse all four operas. So in that sense, they are all rehearsed in the same sort of time frame, regardless if it's Bohem, Aida, or Batali. Thank you. Uh, I know Susan has one more piece for you. Yeah. I heard, but you're introduced. I do. Um, so if you look back again, to my little handout, you'll see the last one, and it's from a quiet place, Vladimir Bernstein, um, which was anything but quiet. Um, can we put this in? Uh -huh. Thank you. So, all I've uh, given you for this is, it's, it's the, uh, an orchestra part. But I wanted to show you what I'm talking about in terms of writing in different instruments. Because if you, if you don't, don't look at my handwriting on there and just look at what's printed, You'll see just you know notes, right? In some directions, slow, fast, etc. Well, that very first measure is played by an electronic bass, which is part of a synthesizer, which is what you have, to, what I had to do for this piece. And so, an, an electronic bass sound is so different from anything else, and it's always got that microphone look sound. And so you play that differently than you would something else. Um, then uh, if you go further to the right of there, you'll see above it is my handwriting for strings, S-T-R, where it says prayerfully. Um, the next line down, you see my little handwriting of little pluses, you see those? That's my way of saying bass is playing pizzicato. Pizzicato is when they do tum, 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 tum. But it's been explained to me many times String players do that, da, 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 but this hand is always going. And so you can't just play short notes. You have to use a little pedal because they always give a vibrato. It's what string players do. And so it's short, but not like really short. All right? So it's that kind of thing. You'll see later on I've written an oboe cue or a flute cue. It's my scribbling this on this. I played this piece um, at City Opera, and I also played it when Leonard Bernstein was writing it. Uh, he, did a, he did workshops in, of it, and he hired a bunch of us who were nobodies at that time. I hadn't started in the Opera House yet. And uh, we would go to the Dakota. Have you ever heard of the Dakota? Well, that's where we rehearsed in his apartment. And he, there was a guard place out in the front, and that's where the music would be left after he finished writing something. So he, we'd get the call out, oh, Lenny's finished another piece. So we would go pick up our music and then learn it really fast and then meet him in another week and play it for him. And let me tell you, that was tough. A, you couldn't read his writing. And B, he, I, he's the one person that I will say is a true 
genius. I mean, he could think things. I had no idea what he was talking about, just by the way he spoke. I played this piece for him when we, he did it for the backers auditions. And um, I didn't play it right, according to him. And he stopped and stopped. And I, it's just me. And he stopped and stopped and stopped. No, too musical. Relax. Don't play so much. And, and, and then I would try, and, and I think I'm, like I'm fairly moving like this. And finally he said, that was good. And I said, thanks. <laughs> I was so relieved. So I, I have enjoyed playing this ever since. I played it in the production, too. The Quiet Place is about um, Sam and Dinah. And uh, it's a sequel to what was written 30 years before called Trouble in Tahiti. And it's, this is a Trouble in Tahiti was after, after it was, it was included into this opera. So it's now done as a flashback. And the opening scene is at Dinah's funeral. And she died about an accident and there was some kind of thought that she'd been drinking and everybody knew that the marriage was always trouble and so that she was despondent. And so that's, that's how it starts with that kind of energy of this is just something's wrong here. And it contains, this first act has 11 different scenes in it and different people have different thoughts and they say them. Uh, hit her brother Bill uh, starts out and he's talking with the funeral director trying to organize all that. Her analyst is there and he's kind of being advisive because he doesn't want to admit what goes on in closed sessions. Uh, Doc, who's the doctor, says, oh, she was a drinker. And then his wife was trying to expose that the uh, funeral director is being a hypocrite. <laughs> That's how it begins. They're all waiting for Sam and Dinah's two kids, Junior and Dee Dee. Dee Dee is the younger one. Uh, she's a little girl, a young girl. And um, Junior is the son who is gay, who is mentally disturbed and um, had as a lover a guy named Francois who turned around and married his sister Dee Dee. So it's a disaster. I mean, it's, it's just awful. They start the funeral and everybody's talking about how they knew Dinah and they're, they're all talking at once. And I'll give you a little side uh, about that. When Lenny first wrote this, he wrote everybody laughing in a certain way and we said, uh, my sir son, what, what were you intending here? And he said, well, I got this call from Jackie. And we're all thinking, Jackie, Jackie Kennedy? And he said, Jackie, and she, was, you know, she was in the big plane. What plane? Air Force One. And we're, you know, I'm from Ohio. We were just, I was so overwhelmed by all this. So he said, yeah, it was Bobby's, Bobby's Bobby had died. Bobby was killed. She wanted him to do the funeral in the Washington Cathedral, I guess, is where they did it. And, and so they were talking about this, and he said, you know, I couldn't hear very well. And, and he said, this is Air Force One. It should have a perfect sound between the plane and the, and the ground. And, uh, and then he realized that everybody, all the family, was in the plane. And they were just doing a good old Irish wake. And everybody was two sheets to the wind and laughing and crying and making all kinds of sound. And that's what inspired this first act. <laughs> so we thought, wow. So anyway, we get to the point where Junior has finally arrived. And he comes in and he's disheveled and he's, and he's angry and he's uh, terrible. Makes a big scene. His father, Sam, is furious. And he sings an aria just directed right at Junior. And even in the music, he's got, uh, Lenny wrote, eyes up, eyes down. So it's like, ba 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 ba, like that. So angry and aggressive. At the end of that, he's spent, he's crying. Francois, the husband of Dee Dee, Junior and Dee Dee sing a little trio about how their relationship with their fathers. Well, Junior lets him have it and, and does this sort of menacing kind of a strict tease right in the funeral parlor. So, but in the end, he calms down 
and he approaches the, the coffin of his mother quietly. And that's where I'm going to start. <laughs> so the first part is that electronic bass. Thank you all again for coming today and another hand for both Susan and Jesse.